In preparation for one of the occasional talks I gave, I looked through my papers and came across a folder marked Lucian. Years had passed since I last opened it. Inside was a paper that had become increasingly yellowed with age. It was a poem written in German. Next to it was a photograph depicting a handsome young man. Oh, Lucian, I thought, how long ago it was and how vividly I remember that unusual episode in my life. The memory of Lucian is a treasure I cherish. He touched me deeply and made an indelible impression on me. I began to read to myself aloud and the poem conjured up memories that lay just beneath the surface. The words jumped out of the page. In remembrance of a tragic and yet so enchantingly beautiful and sad time. Hmm. I had known him only three months of my life, but I will always remember him. The story unfolded before my eyes and suddenly emerged to life. It was still dark when I awoke from a dreamy, restless sleep in April of 1945 in a camp called Retzov am Rechlin. Without opening my eyes, I allowed my thoughts to drift carelessly to the lo lovely park where I used to play as a child. The memories appeared misty and so far away. It all seemed like years ago, somewhere in a different life on a different planet. The gentle autumn wind was blowing my hair as I was chasing a ball, stepping onto the freshly fallen leaves and picking up the skinny, shiny, round fruits of the chestnut trees that covered the ground. I used to collect different multicolored leaves and chestnuts as a hobby. And every autumn, I would spend pl pleasant hours arranging them neatly according to size and color. My mother would lovingly watch my innocent play and carefree fun, and she would occasionally direct my attention to an unusual birch leaf while sitting on a wooden bench reading a book. I would wander off and then hear the echo of mother's mellow voice connecting across the pond, calling for me not to stray too far away. I was back home in Grodno, riding horseback with my father on his chestnut-colored st steed in the woods and around, listening to my mother sing while she prepared our dinner, hearing my sister play the guitar. These were carefree days filled with love and security. All these memories were now only distant recollections of times past, embedded deeply in my mind in clouds of nostalgic, distant thoughts. Unwillingly, I finally opened my eyes and the familiar surroundings jolted me back to reality. Turning lazily to one side, I picked through the opening of the wooden wall next to my bunk. The faint glow of the early morning sun cast its shadows on the earth beneath. Even before the shrill sound of the siren indicating the beginning of another meaningless and monotonous day, I permitted myself the luxury of a few moments of solitude before the rush of the inevitable morning call. Hastily putting on my striped dress and holding my wooden shoes in my hands so as not to rouse the other inmates, I quietly snuck out of the barracks. I stood momentarily undisturbed, breathing the fresh air in the solitude of the early spring morning. A bird tripped away secretly perched on a branch of a building budding tree, not knowing that happy sounds were totally alien to the wary inhabitants below in this forsaken prison camp. I wish I could have turned into a bird and flown away. Well, was there still another world somewhere to fly? For the brief moment, I left my thoughts turn to dreams of freedom. For the past 45 months, almost four years, I had become conditioned to the inevitable predicament of the sinister cloth of death. I never thought I would see freedom, but how and when the end would come, none of us knew. We carried our death certificates on our forearms from which only the date was missing. 
from ghetto, Auschwitz, Ravensbrück, and now to Retzow am Rechlin. Our transport arrived here from Ravensbrück in early February, and the ground was heavily covered with snow. But where was the next stop? Rumors started to circulate that, there was, that the war was coming to an end, and I harbored unrealistic thoughts that maybe, maybe, I would really survive this hell. It was a lovely fantasy that kept my spirits up. The morning sun was beginning to cast its golden rays around me, creating dark and fascinating shadows. In this momentary solitude, the gentle breeze caressed my face and hair, then had grown back to a golden blonde after the total shaving at Auschwitz. This morning I thought of life. I wanted to live very much. I was approaching my 16th birthday and somewhere deep inside, I was beginning to feel the wonder of nature within me. Underdeveloped and deprived, nature nevertheless played havoc with me, letting me know that I was growing into a woman. The shrill sound of the siren announcing the Zellappel cut through the air, jolting me back to reality. We learned to stand in strict attention, sometimes for hours in freezing weather, depending on the whim of the Aufseherin. And after the countdown, we were given breakfast, so to speak, consisting of a slice of stale bread, black bread, diluted coffee, and a slab of sour-tasting margarine. The work commandos would form amidst screaming guards and huge, growling German shepherd dogs. After the inspection, we were automatically lined up for work duty and march off to our assigned destination. Another heavy-laden day would begin. I was brought to Retzow by heavy army trucks after two years of Auschwitz and three weeks in Ravensbrück. Retzow was located about 90 kilometers from Berlin, somewhere deep in the heart of the Third Reich. The camp was adjacent to a munitions factory where the V-2 bombers were being manufactured. I later learned that they had devastated London. The majority of inmates were put to work at the factory. Others were assigned to a forest commando where they chopped down trees and cut into slices and pieces of wood to aid the war production. When we finally landed in Retzow and were initially processed, I was asked what kind of work I did in Auschwitz. I told them I was a Läuferin, a messenger for the officers and grounds in the main Blockführerstube. Good, said the stocky and mean-looking officer. We need an experienced Läuferin here. Put us on your left sleeve and wear it all the time. He gave me a broad bandana with heavily gothic lettering imprinted with words Läuferin, that meant messenger. I was instructed to stand guard inside the camp gates and deliver messages for the guards and officers from the central headquarters located just outside the camp compounds. At all times, a sentry armed with a rifle and watching the prisoners from a tall guard post structure towering above the barracks. When the work commandos left the camp grounds escorted by heavily armed guards and leash dogs, the camp assumed the markings of a normal day. Hmm. I would dutifully position myself at the inside gates, ready and awaiting the commands of my captors. On that morning, perhaps it was the onset of sweet smell of spring, the awakening of nature that made me feel nostalgic and put me into a dreamlike mood that gave way to hope momentarily dispelling the deep scars of years of suffering. I let my thoughts drift back again to my world of fantasy, relieving my tormented soul. Retzow was carved out from a forest, and there were still many trees surrounding the campgrounds. Little wild flowers kept emerging everywhere, ignoring the cruelty of man. Even in this barbed wire could not diminish nature's wonders. I looked up at the sky. 
It was so blue and clear that it looked transparent. I worked. It wa I, I wondered if three people outside the camp in other parts of the world were looking at the same sky. Did anyone know what was going on in my world here? I was overwhelmed with a desire to run to the woods, uninhibited, to touch some that belonged to me, to embrace, to hug, to feel life and free of barbed wire and endless uncertainty and torment. I longed to indulge in all activities I used to take for granted in the short spell of my early childhood, to eat freshly baked bread with butter, delivered to our home fresh from the farm, to take a warm bath and to indulge in careful play with my friends, all of whom had since been killed. I missed the sounds of music, which were so much part of my days at home. Everything about my childhood became a precious dream, and I was clinging to those memories with a stubborn tenacity. The beasts had taken away everything else. Memories they couldn't take away from me. With all this dreaming, I thought, oh, well, spring is having a strong effect on me. It will pass. Keep dreaming. I considered myself, that's all that's left. Freedom appeared to be so near and yet so hopelessly far away, if ever. I was softly humming a song my mother sang to me many years ago, and suddenly I became aware there was being deliberately watched by the guard. He had been in the camp for about two months or so, but we had never engaged words except when he gave me specific orders. For the past few weeks, he was assigned to guard duty. He then over the, resting his rifle over the railing and he's smiling at me. In the last 45 months, I learned to sense the moods and behavior of the peculiar breed of concentration camp guards. I was sure they were chosen for their sadistic predisposition. Most were terribly cruel and thoroughly enjoyed inflicting great pain to their victims. But this guard betrayed no sarcasm. His friendly behavior was a sign I did not understand. I had, been, I had seen him when he accompanied the forest commander during the, the daily duty formation, and he typically assumed the abrasive tone and voice of expected of a concentration camp guard. His fellow comrades nicknamed him Booby, probably because he looked so innocent and young. This morning, his behavior did not reveal what I was generally accustomed to. This guard acted differently. He smiled at me, and without saying anything, he began to sing a German song unfamiliar to me, Zwau Himmelblaue Augen, Two Sky Blue Eyes. The word Achtung cut through me with the air, piercing sound. The young guard drew to attention with his rifle firmly on the shoulder and gave the customary sh sh salute, Heil Hitler. I stood motionless as the commandant was entering the gates for his morning inspection. Achtung had become the most familiar word in my vocabulary, and yet I always froze when I heard it. The commandant, accompanied by three officers of his staff, was about to inspect his domain. He drew an icy glance in my direction and with a good step precision proceeded to enter the, the campgrounds. He was short, broad-shouldered, stocky man, and he was immaculately gr groomed. Many shining medals decorated his spotless uniform. When he gave me orders, his eyes would narrow, expressing a look of intense concentration. His voice had a staccato-like a quality, the typical guttural tones of a German officer. He spoke very rapidly, as though the day was not long enough for him to accomplish all he wanted. I was very frightened of him. The inspection would last about an hour every morning. He stopped briefly at the gate, occasionally giving me a specific instruction, and then he left the campgrounds as rapidly as he entered. The gate would close, his chauffeur standing at attention opened the car door. The guard reappeared, hi Hitler, and within minutes the car drove away. 
I would start breathing again. God, how many times did the commandant respection meant immediate liquidation of the sick, never to be seen again. But in this camp, there were no, no crematoria. People just died from illness, starvation, and exhaustion. With the daily inspection ritual over, I took a deep breath, a breath of relief and retrieved back to my own little private world. I looked up at Booby. He no longer stood at attention. He seemed relaxed and smiled at me again. Perhaps he guessed my thoughts and my fears. Perhaps he too wished to be out of his uniform and back with his family. He seemed so young. I wondered where he came from, what compelled him to join the, the ranks of the German army. Was, he, was his father a Nazi? Was he a, deliver, a this dedicated member of the Hitler Youth, obeying his fatherland, proud of it? How many dead prisoners does he have on his, on, on his conscience? I suddenly heard my name, Fräulein Nina Nelly. Oh, yes, there was no mistake about it. He called my name, Fräulein Nelly. Who ever heard a guard speaking that way to an inmate? How did he know my name? We were generally known by numbers, not names. We were usually barked at, not spoken to, and we were certainly not addressed with polite appellation, Miss as a normal person would be. I looked up at the post. Yeah, I answered in puzzlement. By this time I had acquired a solid knowledge of German and spoke it fluently. Don't look so shocked. I didn't mean to startle you. He realized how surprised I was and reassured me that he only wanted to talk to me. Yes, what would you like me to do? I answered quietly and lifted my eyes in his direction. <coughs> Please, Fräulein Nina. Please, Fräulein Nelly, don't make it obvious that we are speaking. You know, of course, that we are not allowed to speak to inmates. When on duty, unless we give official orders, oh, yes, I knew. I was well acquainted with camp rules. What did he want? I looked to see if other guards were in the vicinity, but no, no one was there. The conversation was strange. Actually, he was... He was he who was speaking and I who was listening. He spoke softly and rapidly as if he had stirred up everything for this very moment. His voice betrayed no sense of strange excitement and an unmistakable anxiety. He looked very earnest. Almost apologetically, he asked, what are you doing in this camp? I mean, how did you get here and why? I have been watching you ever since I was signed to Retsov. You are so young and so lovely, and you can't be more than 14 years old. Hmm. Well, I was sure there was a catch somewhere. No German guard asked such inane questions. I thought he had a weird sense of humor, entertaining himself at my expense. What am I doing here? <laughs> Where had he been in the last four years? I answered politely and stiffly, not looking at him. I am Jewish. I was brought here from Auschwitz and the Ravensbrück. And as far as I know, I am the only member of my family still alive. I will be 16 soon. He must have realized from the expression on my face that I was puzzled, but he continued anyway. Fräulein Nelly, listen to me, please. My name is Lucien. I am not German. I am from Luxembourg, the part that borders the western half of Germany. I'm 19, and until last year, I was enrolled in the university with the hope of medic as a medical student. I was drafted into the German army a year ago. I had no knowledge what was going on here. I learned about the atrocities and the madness only recently. I was forced to join the army. I had no choice. I was sent here as a relief guard. I had no idea what terrible things are being done to the Jews. I learned from the horror tales from the accounts of the seasoned older guards. I couldn't believe how casually they talk about tortures. I dream about the horrors at night. Back home, we knew the plight of the Jews, but had no idea what was really going on. You see, I didn't think you were Jewish. 
And that's why I asked you what you were doing here. I l in listened in utter disbelief. I was stunned. He sounded totally convincing, and I believed he was telling the truth. Why else would he say such things and unburden his feelings? I was not quite 16 and had already lived many lives. I was a seasoned concentration camp inmate. I knew life as a prisoner, but very little of the other world outside my sheltered childhood. Could it be he knew little about the atrocities of war and Hitler's master plan to annihilate the Jewish population of Europe? Didn't people in the free world know what was going on here? His voice sounded so genuine, so full of emotion, so swift and pleading. I looked at him again. He was well built. His blonde hair showed through his military cap with the Nazi emblem. He had a handsomely childish face and full lips and soft blue eyes. He seemed so tall standing there. Lucien suddenly threw to full attention again and uttered Achtung. A cut, a car was pulling up and two officers entered the Blockführerstube. Officers from the munitions plant frequently paid visits to this camp. The brief conversation with Lucien left me strangely puzzled. Could it be that even those wearing a German uniform can feel compassion and care for what happened to inmates? How odd, I thought. I simply was not prepared for anyone wearing that uniform to speak to me in a civilized manner and ask personal questions or care about me as a human being. Shortly after the visit from the officers, Lucien was relieved by another guard. At the end of the day, when the work commandos came back, I joined them for an hour meager evening nourishment. I ran to the barracks of my little space in the bunk I shared with three other girls. There were only women here, about 1,500. I didn't know where they sent the men. I was overcome with strange feelings. What Lucien had said to me and the manner in which he had said it all stuck in my mind. I was touched by his obvious feelings of sincerity. What compelled him to talk to me? I didn't understand. Concentration camp guards were not known to be, inhu were known to be inhumane, but this guard was different. During the following weeks, Lucien and I spoke often. He would initiate the conversation during my duties at the gate, or he would find me in the camp campgrounds. He would frequently ask me about my life, where I was from, what my family was like, and he wanted to know my hardships at Auschwitz. He would frequently say, tell me about it yourself and family life, what you like most about school. He brought an eerie sense of normality into our conversation. Tell me about yourself, I would ask him. I sense great uneasiness in him. I want to tell you so many things about my life too, he would answer. I had a comfortable upbringing, a loving family just like yours. I was enrolled at the university to study medicine. When, well, now I'm here and learning of the horrible atrocities of the war. You see, we are really both victims in a sense, although I don't mean to compare myself to your incredible suffering. I am supposed to be your enemy, but please believe me, I am not. Don't ever stop dreaming and hoping. Your dream may come true. You have so much to live for. Lucien wanted to be my friend. How could that be? His caring for me and his gentle demeanor was made me feel that he was probably right, that we both were victims of Hitler's madness on the opposite poles of the spectrum. I sense feelings of great sadness in him too, at the same very time a genuine concern for me, and I became strongly drawn to him and experienced a sense of confusion. I didn't believe the word humanity still existed outside the dictionary. And yet, here was someone who touched me, a German guard. No wonder I was confused. In moments of dreaming, I dared to hope that maybe someday 
I may be free and experience the wonders of love. And then ominous thoughts would overshadow any glimmer of hope for survival. I was sure they would never let us go and bear witness to their atrocities. I didn't know that the end of the war was very near and that I would be one of the few lucky ones to survive. <clears throat> a few days later, while I was eating in the same camp kitchen because I worked in the inside camp, I was given permission to eat there. I suddenly saw Lucien enter. I overheard him speaking to this SS matron in charge. He must have asked her for something specific because she gave him a polite smile and left the kitchen. For the first time, I found myself alone with him. He walked with a steady pace to the small table that at the end of the kitchen where I was sitting. Our eyes met. His eyes were the most intense and blue I could color I have ever seen. I felt strangely uncomfortable and a bit frightened. I sensed that he too felt uneasy. He stood a few feet away from me and glanced to see whether anyone was near us. Satisfied that no one was watching, he came closer to my bench while I continued to eat secretly glancing at him. He hesitated at first and then spoke very softly. I have been assigned to guard the commandos, the forest commandos. I'll probably be with them for a few weeks and I want you to get transferred to that unit. I must speak to you away from this place and what I have to say cannot be said here. I know the commandant likes you and if you ask him for his permission, he will probably let you go. I have something important to, to tell you. Do it quickly. We heard footsteps and the matron approaching and he quickly walked away from me. The matron handed him a package wrapped in brown paper. She smiled at him and they exchanged a few words of, ple of pleasantries. He thanked her and quickly walked out. He left me with a feeling very puzzled. I could not imagine what it was he wanted to tell me with such great urgency. The following morning, after the commandant's routine inspection, I asked permission to speak to him. He threw me a cold glance and bluntly said, come on with me. I followed him to the Blockführerstube. What do you want, Leuferin? I couldn't believe what I was mustered up, where I mustered up my courage. A feeling of great fear engulfed me. This stern looking man was very intimidating. I reasoned with myself that after all, I did see him every day, so he knows who I am. With great trepidation, I began. Herr Commandant, I came to ask for permission to be transferred to the forest commando. I have never been out, worked outside the campgrounds, and the other lawyerin has already rotated. I suppose it soon will be my turn, but please forgive my boldness. I tried very hard not to tremble, but I felt my knees weakening under me. It was unusual for an inmate ever to request anything, particularly from a commandant. But this was a different kind of a camp, smaller than most and a bit more relaxed in discipline. There were no, there were no death selections here and no crematoria. It was known as a work camp rather than an extermination camp. The commandant eyed me carefully, walked slowly and deliberately over to me, almost with a sense of amusement and mockingly said, hmm, so you, want, you would like to go into the world and walk is in the forest, would you? Well, you look strong enough to chop trees and carry heavy logs. Hard work will do you good. Yeah, you can go, then permission granted. Arrogantly, as though talking to himself in amusement, he repeated, you want to leave the campgrounds, do you? Well, go now. And that was that. I thanked him politely and ran out of the Blockführerstube. I was shaking all over and my heart was pounding so rapidly I thought it would jump right out of my body. The following morning, I joined the forest commando. As I marched with the women, one said, welcome to slavery and keep your strength up, little one. The inmates were generally divided into groups of 200 and each group was accompanied by eight heavily armed guards as though any of us would ever think of escaping. 
the grotesque Auschwitz tattoo number on my 31386 on my left arm branded for life. Here I was known as number one of the guard. Here I was known by the number 106487. There could never be as an escape, even here. Lucien was one of the guards in my group and tacitly acknowledged my presence with our eyes met. We marched about two miles and finally reached a heavily wooded area. We were given instructions administered with loud, abrasive tones. The guards never talked to us. They always shouted. But I was more afraid of the ferocious-looking German shepherd dogs. It brought terrible moments and memories of Auschwitz when these dogs were unleashed as a prisoner at the whim of a guard for the slightest infraction. They could m literally mutilate a prisoner in minutes. I was assigned to chop and carry the logs to an assigned area in a clearing of the forest. Later, trucks would pick up the wood and, use, and they used it in some aspect for war production. Lucien now assured the role, assumed the role of a real tough guy. He walked to my assigned post and open, started to criticize my ineptitude, shouting at me. He succeeded in the role of the master over his prisoners, but the part somehow didn't fit him. He de detected, I detected an artificial tone in his voice. This time passed, my arms became terribly tired from the heavy annual manual labor. In Auschwitz, I carried stones. Here, I carry wood. I began to wonder whether an opportunity would arise for us to talk. The guards were scattered all around, smoking cigarettes and talking among themselves while keeping a close watch over us. Lucien tapped me on my shoulder and loudly ordered me to follow him to work in another area of the forest. I obeyed like a trained dog and walked away with him. Everyone could hear him shouting at me. I knew what he was doing. I was relieved that he finally found the right moment to drag me away. He found our, we found ourselves in a, in a bit further away from the others in a mere, small, isolated part of the forest. Except for sounds of voices and falling logs, there was no one in the immediate vicinity. His voice now changed to the mellow tone I heard when, I first, when he first spoke to me. Nelly, I want to tell you how glad I am that you managed to be transferred here. I know this is very hard work, but I want to talk to you about a matter of vital importance. So please listen carefully and say absolutely nothing. You realize, of course, that I had to make a scene there for the benefit of the others, or they may have suspected something. I could be punished as severely as you. I don't want the other guards to suspect anything at all. I don't trust them. He continued soberly in a whisper, listen, the war is coming to an end, we all know that. We are surrounded on all sides by the Russians, the Americans and the British. The top hierarchy is getting very nervous because they know the end is near. We, got new, we get new orders of the devastation of the German armies every day. It can't last very much longer. Panic is bound to follow particularly regarding the fate of concentration camp survivors. At the moment, everything is still the same, but that will change. No new orders about the prisoners have come in, but the word is floating around that the inmates of this camp may be marked for liquidation so that no hard evidence is found. There is no question that the Germans are kaput. Before they have a chance to take you away from here, I must help you. He looked at me with a steady gaze. I listened with fear and trepidation to his monologue while he encouraged me to keep on working. The whole episode was so incongruous, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I put my hand on my mouth in astonishment to protect myself from screaming out. How unreal, how unreal for a Jewish girl in a Nazi camp standing in the woods with a soldier wearing a German uniform armed with a gun and a dog who wants to help me escape. I was looking at his uniform, looking at his eyes, 
listening to his words, but being reminded by the reality of what, is, what, what he represented. Trust him? I must be dreaming. It couldn't be real. But I listened attentively as, as he continued. Nelly, he said tenderly, I want to help you in my way I can, in any way. Listen carefully. Since I was transferred here, I have known a German woman who lives near, in, near the village in a small farm a few kilometers away from here. I have arranged with her to let you hide in her cellar until the war is over. She promised to give me civilian clothes for you. When the time is right, I will take you there. Trust me. When the evacuation orders came, there will be much confusion. Nobody will really care much anymore. It will be the perfect opportunity to sneak, out to, to, to sneak you out of here. There is no need to give you the details now at my plan of this time. What is important is that I get you out of here soon, or it just may be too late. She lost her husband and two sons herself, and she feels very bitter about the war. She knows about this camp and promised to help me. Now, forget what I have told you and promise and don't breathe a word to anyone. In this camp about this, the war, or we will both hang. I felt numb all over. Did I really understand what he was saying to me? go into hiding, survive the war with the help of a German soldier? Someone actually cares what happens to me? Why do you want to take such a risk to help me? I ask quietly. What, what, why, why do I deserve this concern for me? Booby looked at me and his eyes suddenly swallowed, swelled up. A strange feeling overwhelmed me, a feeling I had not experienced before. Liebchen, you are naive not to have noticed how I feel about you. You are so lovely, you are so young and innocent in spite of the hardships you endured these awful years. Haven't you guessed that I love you? Don't you understand? I love you and I don't want, to die. I don't want you to die. I never dreamt that anyone could stir me to such deep, tender emotion. The love I feel for you is more than a care I, can, I care to express at this moment. I want to hold you and kiss you and protect you. I know the time will come. The only thing I do now is to make sure that you are safe and that I must help you. Lucian kept repeating, I must help you. I want you to live over and over as though he wanted to reassure himself that he could really make it happen. I looked at him, bewildered why he had just, what had just transpired. He came closer and stretched out his hand to, me, to mine. He held it tenderly. Look at the ugly blisters on your hands. Don't worry, little one, they will go away. Don't lose hope and have faith in the future. Silence fell. I sensed his desire to take me in his arms and kiss me. He continued to hold my hands and kiss them gently and finally said, you better get back with the others. Lucian had awakened feelings in me I did not even understand or that ever existed inside of me. The entire episode seemed unreal. Escape, hiding, love, a future? These were totally alien thoughts from a totally alien world. I finally broke the silence by thanking him and saying how touched I was by his sentiments. I mumbled that he had pro I mumbled that what he had proposed would probably be unrealistic. I knew what they did to people who even mildly entertained the thought of escape. I remember vividly a beautiful Polish Jewish girl inmate hanging from the gallows in Auschwitz after being severely tortured when she, caught, when she was caught trying to escape. Uh, this were different here, but still the penalty was, I'm sure, the same. In April of 1945, I had little choice. We were probably going to be killed anyway, so I agreed. 
Lucien assured me that he had planned this for the past few weeks and he took great care to make sure that everything would go smoothly. The woman on the farm, he assured me, promised to hide me. He did not elaborate how it would finally be accomplished, but I will tell you everything when all the arrangements are made. Lebe wohl, my Liebchen, he said, and walked away. A few minutes later, I joined the rest of the commando. I was physically there, but my thoughts were miles away. There were people still in this world who care about others after all. But how unlikely this source. What a strange twist of fate. I worked with the forest commando for two weeks and returned to my duties as Lauferin. Lucien and I continued to talk. He was also back at the guard post and he took every opportunity to seek me out whenever possible within the confines of the camp grounds. He would continue to assure me that the plan he proposed in the forest would work out. I have spoken with my friend at the farm. As soon as it is possible, I will smuggle you out of here. He gave me, he gave me feelings of security and hope and something much more. I missed him if a day or two went by and I did not see him. I thought I was in love. It was a splendid little secret I harbored within me. I did not share my feelings with anyone else. When we met, we would talk to me, he would talk to me about our lives after the war, and my eyes would fill up with tears. Why are you crying, he would ask. Because you talk of freedom and sharing our lives together as though it would really happen. This is the first time in many years since I have cried, since at last time I held my dying sister in my arms at Auschwitz. You see, Lucien, these tears are now flowing out of tenderness rather than sorrow. I had allowed myself to feel something beyond grief and was, un and was un unaccustomed to that kind of a tender emotion. You have touched me very deeply. I hope I will always be, we can always be friends if we survive this madness. He kept reassuring me that it would happen. I hope we will be more than friends, he said. I know you have lost your entire family. I want to take you home to my family in Luxembourg. My family is very kind and will help to heal the wounds. I felt very strong emotions towards Lucien, far beyond the kindness he had shown me. I wanted to protect him from the world too. I wanted to be with him. I loved him. I began to dream childish dreams about Luxembourg, a country I knew nothing about. At the end of April, we learned the orders were sh abruptly received that all the younger officers and guards were to be sent to the front within 24 hours. The air raids increased with a marked frequency. The munitions plant where most inmates worked, we were told, was severely damaged and I stood in front of the barracks and with fascination watched the heavy cluster of red lights far up in the sky as the heavy bombers glided over the German skies. Yes, there was another world after all. The roar exploding bombs made a wonderful sound. It was music to my ears. I wanted I was not frightened by the possibility of being killed by an American or Russian bomb. If I have to die, let me be killed that way than being shot somewhere in the woods. I stood outside my bunk and a guard would yell at me to get inside. Maybe it's not over yet. We just heard on the radio that President Roosevelt had died. America was the land miles and millions away in another world, in, a gal in another galaxy. The following day, as he was walking off his post, Lucien loudly and abruptly announced, Leuferin, deliver my dinner tray to my office at the commandant's store. It was not unusual for me to deliver dinner trays to the uniform, to, to the officers, but Lucien had never asked me to do this before. I was startled and elated at the same time because I was hoping that he would tell me that the time has come for him to smuggle me out of his camp. I kept thinking of nothing else that I stood guard for the rest of the afternoon. I knew something was going on. Officers were running around, 
cars were coming and going, and there seemed to be a general state of confusion. I walked from the kitchen, carrying the dinner tray, and as a guard opened the gate for me, I entered the commanded tour with great trepidation, almost secretly, as though I anticipated something ominous. A state of confusion prevailed inside me too. Officers were running in and out of their rooms as I walked into the main hall. Telephones were ringing all over. It seemed that nobody paid much attention to my being there. A door opened and Lucian motioned for me to follow him. I entered behind him. He silently indicated to put the tray on his desk and gently closed the door. He was informally dressed and appeared pale and tense. I had always seen him in full uniform and never without a rifle. Tonight, his jacket was unbuttoned, revealing a clean white shirt and no tie. He nodded to me as though to acknowledge my presence. He seemed uneasy and vulnerable. My first impression was that perhaps someone had overheard our conversations and suspected something and I felt frightened. I had never stay, stayed behind closed door with him and there was visible tension in his face and began to understand why he summoned me to his office on the pretense of bringing his, his dinner. Obvious, I became ob it became obvious to me that my feelings there had little to do with my duties as law friend. My being there was a purely private matter. <clears throat> I waved anxiously for him to speak. I was suddenly overcome with strange emotions. My body stiffened. I was not cold. It was not cold fear I was feeling. There was something else, something I did not understand. I had felt strange and unknown tenderness towards him since our meeting in the woods. How strange, I thought. Finding myself alone in a room with him, I grew anxious for him to say something, but he just kept looking at me. Was he going to tell me tonight that his plan was in progress and he would sneak me out of his, out of this camp? He played impatiently with his hands and finally he reached into his pocket, in his jacket pocket, and took out an envelope. Without looking at me, he spoke in a whisper. I was informed last night that we are being transferred to the front. We are leaving tomorrow morning. The older guards will stay. A shiver went through my spine. He looked up at me now and looked in the deep into my sigh. I cannot help you get out of here, Nelly. There is no time. He paused momentarily. I was awake all night thinking of you and have written a poem for you. When you read it, you will understand my real feelings toward you. You will also find a photograph of me in civilian clothes. Keep it with you always if you can and don't forget me. I will only pray that you will get out of here alive. I took the envelope from him with trembling hands. Lucian came closer. He took my hands and caressed them gently. He pushed, me, he pushed my left sleeve up, looked at the grotesque tattoo on my left arm and kissed it. You know, I have never been in love and I don't know how to tell you what I want to tell you. Words fail to express the love that I hold for you. If we had met under normal circumstances, I would never let you go. You have done something quite extraordinary to me and I don't even understand it myself. All I know is that I hold you most tender feelings toward you and I long to hold, in, in, to hold you in my arms. I will always love you and somehow I believe that I will meet again when all this is over. If I live, I will find you. We will be together. I will find you, I promise. I felt my eyes filling up with tears again. It was the second time he brought my out tears in me. Strange, I thought. I cannot cry when I feel grief, but tears fill my eyes in moments of tenderness. I stood there holding on to the edge of the table. When Lucien took me in his arms and held me very close, don't cry, Lipchen, he said, and kissed, my firmly, kissed me firmly on my lips. 
He took my face in his hands and his eyes looked at me with great passion. He breathed, breathed heavily. Dearest girl, do you know what it, what it may be the last time I, I might even see you? Strange, is it not, that I, a soldier in Hitler's army, one of the many who have done you so much wrong, should be standing here asking you to forgive me for a crime I did not commit. But I am wearing the uniform of those who have done you so much harm. His words kept pouring out in a whisper. The last few months have been the most miserable and difficult ones in my life, and yet, in a way, they were also the happiest because you gave me awakened the deep love inside of me. He kissed me gently again. I remained locked in his arms, not understanding what was happening to me. I wanted to tell him that I loved him too, but I could not utter a word. I put the envelope safely in my pocket and touched his face and wished him luck. Who knows, I said quietly, maybe we will meet again soon. I will never forget you, Lucien. Lebe wohl. I kissed him gently on his lips and squeezed his hands. I looked at him for the last time as he, walked, as he watched me walk out. The guards opened the gates for me and said, What did you do there? Clean the whole place? I ran to my barracks thinking that my heart would jump out of my body. I was clutching Booby's envelope. Oh, how I wanted to cry. How I wanted to share my thoughts with someone. I was still deeply engrossed in my thoughts when evening came and gave way to night. I had never experienced the beauty and pain of love's longing. Inside me, nature stirred up pent-up emotions of a young woman. Yes, I felt love and joy, longing and pity and great sadness. Would I ever experience the full meaning of culmination of nature's glorious gift, that of sharing my love with a man? I wanted more than ever to live. What cruel fate, I thought, standing frustrated and confused on that beautiful April night. I was hoping for a glimpse of another world, a world that existed only in segments of my imagination when reality became too harsh and I entered my private domain of fantasy. It was that fantasy that had kept me alive. Tonight, fantasy gave birth, birth to reality. I felt a tender feeling of love toward Lucien. The moon and stars were so bright that evening that I engaged myself in conversation with them, just the stars and I. I read and reread Booby's poem by the light of the moon. He poured out the most glorious sentiments and love in an exquisite poetic form. And he told me that to be brave, he would find me and then he would be, we would be together. He would never let me go. Yes, I thought, that would be wonderful. I had never been kissed before, and I still felt his warmth on my lips. The feeling awoke such tender emotions in me. Oh, Lucien, I miss you so much. I looked back at the commandantur and saw the light burning in his office. I was overwhelmed with great longing to be with him again. Only the millions of faraway stars knew how I felt at that very moment. New guards replaced those who left, mostly Romanians and Bulgarians. They were generally much older and, worse, and worse, worse than the Germans. The days that followed brought great anxiety and uncertainty regarding our, our fate. The air raids continued to a greater pace. We were sure we would be taken to the woods and shot. There was no question that the war was ending and we did probably our lives as well. Lucien's letter and photograph was safely tucked away in my dress. It was my most important possession. Wherever I could, I read it and his words gave me courage and it clinged to hope. I missed seeing him very much. A few days later, we were rudely jolted from our sleep by the sound of a siren in the middle of the night. We were rounded up for a roll call and we were told that we are being evacuated immediately. Panic erupted. We didn't believe them. We were sure we were going to be killed. I wish Lucy were still with us. He would have told me the truth. As we prepared to leave, I managed to take 
a few personal possessions, including a small one by two inch pin neatly embroidered with my number 106487. My number in this new camp, a birthday gift from a fan who worked as a seamstress for the officers. I pinned it onto my dress, which was a bizarre thing to do. Did I want to die with an embroidered number pinned to my dress? The most important possession in my dress, of course, was in my pocket, was clutching Lucien's poem and photograph. Once again, as so many times before, we were driven out of the camp like obedient cattle and ordered to march. An evacuation, but where to? We marched hungry and exhausted night and day, stopping only for a little while every few hours. The rest, the rest was essentially for the benefit of the guards. We didn't matter. The guards didn't really know what to do with us. It seemed like a journey without an end. Dear God, where was our destination? If they wanted to kill us, they would have done so in the woods. These were questions on the minds of those of us who could still walk and still think. Would the liberators come in time? The roar of the cannons were now coming closer. The guards were beginning to lose interest in their prisoners and worried more about themselves and the consequences they would face. Those wonderful sounds of bullets gave an encouragement and hope. If we could only survive this torturous march, perhaps freedom was not that far away. I kept thinking of Lucian's words, Remain strong, my love. Persevere, and you will make it. I will find you. Poor, wonderful Lucian. Where was he? We continued to walk from sheer habit because there was no choice. Many did not make it. They fell by the wayside and were left there to die. Nobody could help them. There were no tears left to cry for them. I could stop thinking about Lucian. I recognized the guard who used to alternate with him at the gate. He was usually tough and abusive, but having nothing more to fear, I ventured to ask him casually. Oh, by the way, what happened to the young guard they used to call Booby? He looked up at me sideways. And in a matter-of-fact voice, devoid of any emotion, he said, ah, that one at the gate, Booby? Yeah, we got words about him last week that he was killed in action on the Russian front. <sighs> He's better off anyway. He'll probably be all, we will probably all be taken prisoners by the Russians. They are not far away. He uttered the words without a sign of regret or pity. Nothing. He was just another casualty of war. This was accepted as part of life. The price you pay for the fatherland. My heart stopped beating for a moment. A great emptiness overcame me. I felt a terrible sadness. I kept thinking of his decent and sensible young man. Lucien should have lived, but Hitler's madness had taken a toll on everybody, the good and the bad, the innocent and the guilty. Lucien was dead. He died defending a country he did not belong to. He came to despise the symbolism on fear of his uniform evoked by those he guarded. He gave me a glimmer of a beautiful and kind soul. In my heart, I quietly began to mourn my lovely and gentle young friend. On May the 5th, 1945, having survived the endless march, I was liberated by the Russian army somewhere deep in the heart of what was left of Germany and Hitler's Third Reich. Under a large birch tree, with tears in my eyes, I opened the envelope again and read, in memory of a tragic and yet enchantingly beautiful time, to you, my beloved Nelly, little girl, can you imagine how in the stillness of dark night my heart is full of love and longing for you? Little girl, can you imagine? Just ask the stars. They will tell you how my heart is calling for you. Just ask the stars. Verses written with a poetic wonder and youthful love. The concluding line said, don't ever lose courage and always be full of hope. 
you who have suffered beyond endurance will be rewarded for your suffering. The good is yet to come. If it is God's will that I should live, I shall search for you and I shall find you. I love you, Lebewohl. But Lucien would find me no more. I looked at his photograph and the image of this gentle, lovely face. As far as his German comrades were considered, he was also forgotten. I wish I had known his last name or had known the town from which he came. I would have tried to locate his family in Luxembourg to tell them of their beloved Lucien. He will always live in my memory, even now, so many years later. His gentle soul and words remain within me. He touched me very deeply with his love and caring. Comfortably resting in my chair in America many, woods, many words later, as I hold his poem and photograph, my memories travel back to those tragic days in Retsov. Could the guard have been mistaken about Lucien's death? Could he have been perhaps taken prisoner could he perhaps still be alive? I will never know. I only know that I will never forget him. He brought a glimmer of hope and tenderness to me at a time when my world was empty and hopeless. He left me with a glimmer of light amidst a world of darkness. He left me with a sense of wonderment that my capacity for love had not vanished, even in the most unlikely place on earth, surrounded by beasts who walked like men. He will continue to live on in my memory. Oh, Lucien, I have not forgotten you. It is human nature to forgive and forget. One cannot forgive mass murder, but one can forgive one individual, and I have forgiven Lucien for the crime he did not commit. And as I have done a number of times before, I then started to reread his beautiful poem, which is translated from the German. And this is the translation of Lucien's poem from the German, Retzow am Rechlin, April 1945. In memory of a tragic and yet so enchantingly beautiful and youthful time to you, my little Nelly. Spring evening, your solitude lets my memories bloom and shimmer. It sits my heart to quiet dreams and let them flow with abandonment. The glowing sunset over green fields illustrates the sky like a burning fire. Where the sun was just shining in darkness, they emerged, it emerged from the dark. When the sun was just shining, darkness has emerged from the black forest. The robin sings his useful song. And the first little star emerges and the moon begins to rain. Oh, you beautiful glimmering night sky. You let me forget all my worries. My heart has never felt such beauty as you, my glorious spring night. And yet I'm sad. Now why am I sad? Why? Little girl, can you ever know how in the east, still of the night, Full of longing, I think of you. Little girl, can you ever know? Speak to the stars and let them tell you how much my heart is full of longing for you, how with every, every beat it fears for you. Just ask the stars. And when all breaks, remain strong, girl, and never lose courage. Always remember that in the faraway field, my heart will always beat for you. Who knows the fickleness of fate? Fate, that is hard today, will shine on us again and laugh with us again tomorrow. I will then with renewed strength fight for you. I will search for you and I will find you. Have faith in the future. Lebe wohl, ewig, forever yours, Lucien. Did it. I believe I did it. Yes, you did I did the whole thing. Yes, you did. I didn't expect to. I did. Did it come out okay? It came out beautifully.
Um, you know something, I haven't read it since. I mean, I, I purposely didn't want to read it before. I wanted to be fresh. So I made a couple of mistakes, but it doesn't matter. You did beautifully. Um, Where is the camera? This? This is my better side. <laughs> Beautiful, and you did a beautiful job. Really In other words, he was taken away. Oh, forget it. Although that, that, that camp wasn't so crazy, but even with that, you simply don't, you didn't do things like that. But I didn't realize, I mean, my first kiss, a very sweet, light, light kiss on my lips, came from a, this beautiful young man. Well, you saw his photograph. Cute as could be. I remember him so clearly. I wish I knew his last name. I would have gotten in touch with his family. I don't know where, who, I didn't know anything about. His name was Booby. Well, that's growth. That's it. You can do something with it. But Lucian, of course, is, Booby is what they called him. Like he told me his name is Lucian, which is a very common name in Luxembourg, I understand. Is it still on? Why? <laughs> okay, I have to get up. Thank you so much.